This lecture covers Beowulf lines 1651 through 2424. When Beowulf returns to Herat after his fight with Grendel's mother, Hrothgar gives him some advice. He says, O flower of warriors, beware of that trap. Choose, dear Beowulf, the better part, eternal rewards. Do not give way to pride. For a brief while your strength is in bloom, but it fades quickly, and soon there will follow illness, or the sword will lay you low, or a sudden fire, or surge of water, or jabbing blade, or javelin from the air, or repellent age. Your piercing eye will dim and darken, and death will arrive, dear warrior, to sweep you away. So he's saying, you know, your strength is only going to last you a while. You need to really um, work on those other aspects of yourself and don't allow yourself to give way to pride. Uh, this picture I, it just kind of cracks me up anyway because Beowulf does look very prideful. He's like, he's saying, oh yeah, I am all that. And Rothgar is kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, sure you are. But um, also, I want you to remember that uh, realize that we have this thing about the eternal rewards. Of course, that's the monk interjecting, saying, you know, the the uh, things that we have here on earth really don't mean much. It is the eternal rewards that are the things that we should be looking for. So Beowulf's impending departure from uh, Herat is enough to bring Hrothgar to tears. And so the good and gray-haired Dane, that high-born king, kissed Beowulf and embraced his neck, then broke down in sudden tears. Two forebodings disturbed him in his wisdom, but one was stronger. Nevermore would they meet each other face to face. Of course, I always wonder what the other foreboding was. Maybe he knows that Roth, uh, Rothhof will one day betray him. I'm not sure. Anyway, less than ten lines later, we learn that Hrothgar dies of old age. Not a warrior's death by any means. This makes me wonder about the Anglo-Saxon audience's impression of Hrothgar. Would he be admired as an elderly lord, or would they look down upon him for not being able to handle Grendel on his own? There are lots of things about this poem and its audience that we can just never know. So Beowulf and his uh, men returned to the land of the Geats, to the community ruled by his uncle, Hijlak, and Hijlak's wife, Hijd. Now it's important to remember, once again, we have this uncle-nephew relationship. Uh, Beowulf's mother is Hijlak's sister. So Hijlak and Beowulf have this uncle-nephew closeness uh, that we f find throughout this poem. And this is where we are introduced to Beowulf as storyteller. Um, he's telling uh, about his fight with Grendel in lines 2073 through 2100, and his fight with Grendel's mom in lines 2135 to 41. And I find it really interesting of what uh, details he tells about his story and what details he leaves out. And there are things that we learn in his telling of the fight with Grendel that uh, didn't come up before. So I wonder, is he embellishing his tale? Or um, is this just maybe a fact that the storyteller didn't tell us earlier? Um, and also think about what seems important to him in his storytelling. Um, he appears to spend a uh, a little time on the actual fight, but actually devotes a great deal of attention to gift giving and to proper behavior. So these would seem the things that seem more um, important to him. Also, he always, he says about his fight, and you will have heard about my fight. So evidently, his, the songs that they made about his, his uh, struggle with Grendel have preceded him. So Beowulf uh, then tells Hijlak and Hijd about Hrothgar's daughter, Freya Waru. Uh, that's F-E-R-E. I mean, F-R-E-A-W-A-R-U, and her upcoming marriage. 
She is being married to the lord of the Heath of Bards, Ingeld, as a peace pledge between them and the Danes. Evidently there's been a battle between the two groups, and she is being sent into this marriage to help heal the wounds between the battle. But Beowulf sees that it will lead to trouble, and this is what he says. He says, Think how the Heathobards are bound to field, their lord Ingeld and his loyal thanes, when he walks in with that woman to the feast, that woman meaning uh, Freya Waru. Danes are at the table being entertained, honored guests in glittering regalia, burnished ring mail that was their host's birthright, looted when the Heathobards could no longer wield their weapons in the shield clash when they went down with their beloved comrades and forfeited their lives. Then an old spearman will speak while they are drinking, having glimpsed some heirloom that brings alive memories of the massacre. His mood will darken, and heart-stricken, in the stress of his emotion, he will begin to test a young man's temper and stir up trouble. So what he's saying here is that here we're going to have this marriage, uh, this wedding, and at the reception after the wedding, everybody's going to be wearing their finest. Well, the Danes are going to be wearing um, things that, that they um, earned in battle, you know, like when they when they fight another group and they defeat that other group, they strip their bodies and take the weaponry and the, and the uh, jewelry and the ornaments and things off of the bodies. Well, the group that the Danes fought were the Heathobards, the very people uh, that they are with here at this wedding. And so they're going to be wearing their finest. So what Beowulf is saying is that people are going to be together, they're going to get drunk, and then somebody's going to point out, um, like at, for instance, uh, a, a jewel that somebody is wearing and say something like, you know, wasn't that your father's jewel? Uh, and then the person who uh, whose father it was will be thinking this man killed my father and took that jewel from his body so of course this is going to lead to to fighting to war to problems and although Freya Waru is supposed to be a peace pledge between the two it's going to be very very difficult to maintain peace I think this says a lot about Beowulf's wisdom. He's not so set in tradition that he can't see the problems associated with it. And so this really gives him a, a fullness of character uh, for me that very few other things would. So a lot of time passes in a few short lines. Um, a lot was to happen in later days in the fury of battle. Hijlak fell and the shelter of Herdred's shield proved useless against the fierce aggression of the Shilfings, ruthless swordsmen. They came against him and his conquering nations and with cruel force cut him down, so that afterwards the wide kingdom reverted to Beowulf. He ruled it well for fifty winters, grew old and wise as warden of the land, until one began to dominate the dark. Notice that Beowulf rules the Geats for 50 years before his encounter with the dragon. That's the same amount of time that Hrothgar ruled Herat before Grendel showed up. Obviously, we're supposed to compare Beowulf with Hrothgar. And how do you compare them? Do you feel that Beowulf seems to be uh, a better uh, lord than what Hrothgar was? So think about that comparison. So finally now, we come to Beowulf's third battle this time with a dragon. The poet tells us that this treasure is from a lost tribe. There were many other heirlooms heaped inside the earth house because long ago with deliberate care somebody now forgotten had buried the riches of a high-born race in this ancient cache. Death had come and taken them all in time at all in times gone by, and the only one left to tell their tale, the last of their line, could look forward to nothing but the same fate for himself. He foresaw that his joy in the treasure would be brief. So this is um, what happens in an oral society. We don't know what group um, held this treasure or who it belonged to, because um, the last one to, that was the only one left to tell their tale finally died and their story died with him and so once again this is why Beowulf um, 
needs his stories to circulate in all these different mead halls so that if um, his line dies out at least his story is being told in other lines and as long as his story is being told then he won't be forgotten so the monk wants us to realize that this is earthly treasure and won't mean anything to us once uh, we have died so Think about what was stolen from the dragon's hoard, and think about the biblical significance of this item. Of course the dragon seeks vengeance for the theft, and ends up burning down Beowulf's mead hall. Think about Beowulf's reaction to the burning. It threw the hero into deep anguish, and darkened his mood. The wise man thought he must have thwarted ancient ordinance of the eternal Lord broken his commandment. His mind was in turmoil. Unaccustomed anxiety and gloom confused his brain. Compare the Beowulf here with the hero who fought Grendel and Grendel's mother. Is this age setting in? Does Beowulf seem a lot more like Hrothgar here? So this section of the reading then ends with Beowulf and his things uh, heading for the dragon's lair. How many men does Beowulf take with him? Look at line 2407. How would this number relate to Christ? The monk is getting pretty heavy handed here with his comparison between Beowulf and, and Christ. How is Beowulf facing the battle with the dragon like Christ facing his own crucifixion? So we'll finish the story then in the next screencast. Thank you.